What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer. Across from me in the workroom adjacent to the chairman's suite wow. of the Falcons Team Hotel is Tori McElhaney. Uh, we just got off of a plane, then got onto a bus, then got off of, uh, off of a bus, right. then checked into the rooms, and immediately came here to record a podcast for you fine fellows. You know, you're welcome. <laughs> Atlanta Falcons fans, um, obviously trying to break down and analyze, figure out what happened after a 31-27 to loss to the Los Angeles Rams in Inglewood, California. Los Angeles, a city that, we fe- that we're really just in and right. have now left because the Falcons are on a two-game road swing across the West Coast playing the Rams and the Seahawks. We're not going to get into the Seahawks just yet. You will have a week's worth of coverage for that. Let's dive into... Tory, this game against the Rams, mm-hmm. which didn't start well. Right. They fell <laughs> down 25 points in the second half. They were down 21 to 3 in the first half. Then came roaring back, thanks to some opportune defense and an excellent special teams play, and found themselves ever so close to winning this game. Mm -hmm. I just said a whole lot of things <laughs> in a row. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Give me your impression of what it was like to experience and then listen to others speak and react to what was a crazy finish. Yeah, it was a really, honestly, from start to finish, it felt like the first two quarters of the game were just vastly different than the last two quarters, obviously. But being there and watching it, it didn't feel, it was crazy because it didn't feel like there was a comeback mounting until Troy Anderson blocked the punt. And Lorenzo Carter ran it in for a touchdown. I and thought that was with five minutes to, to yeah, go. Yeah, that was with five quarter. minutes to go. And even before then, I never felt like this was like a mounting comeback. But as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, shoot, like we've got ourselves a game here. Now, does that negate what happened in the first half? No. And I'm sure we're going to get into all of that. But like for me, it was a fun game to cover. And as much as I think people are probably upset by the outcome, I mean, that's this this type of craziness is what we love about football from start to finish. So I don't hate it. <laughs> yeah, and this is the kind of craziness that Falcons fans experienced a lot last year. Mm-hmm. They lost games by some significant margins. They won a bunch of them. It's almost like they games. they flipped it from last week. Like last week they played three quarters of great football and then kind of like fall off the the whack, the wheels fall off in the fourth quarter and then you switch it and now it's like play not great in the first half and then the second half in the fourth quarter it's like like what you said they come roaring back and so it's kind of flipping it's on on its head yeah and I don't and so we are going to address a number of different topics on this Falcons final whistle which is taking place at 10 19 p.m that's pacific time so everybody in Atlanta is is snuggled up tight in their beds right now. (laughs) If Um, you can't tell by our voices. We're very tired, tired. but we were not going to skip. No. That's not what we do here at the Falcons Final Whistle. What we are going to do on this episode is we're going to kind of break this thing down, get get a bit deeper into what was a pretty significant comeback where the Falcons had three minutes to score a touchdown to win it, Mm -hmm. not just to tie it, but to win it. They had all of the big mo. They had all the momentum. We're also going to to talk about some things that happened in the first half that allowed them to fall into such a deep hole, namely their red zone inefficiency, their struggles on third down. And then we're going to get into two specific individuals. Uh, Number one, Kyle Pitts, who uh, to this point only has – four catches for 38 yards on 10 targets and Drake London who has more than 150 yeah. and scored a touchdown in his NFL debut. So we're gonna, we're going to get to all of that over the course of the next 15-ish minutes or until until I we s- stop talking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or maybe until we just, you know, fall asleep. That's Which, that's true. Whichever one comes <laughs> first. So let's let's start this podcast at the end of the game. Okay. And we talked a little bit about this comeback and when it kind of felt real. but And it's weird because if you look at it and the tide kind of turned by by scoring, you know, Drake London scores his first NFL touchdown in the third quarter with three minutes left. Mm-hmm. That felt like a kind of like a garbage time touchdown. Yeah. And then the defense, which it has done a lot over the first two games, made a big play. Yep. 
Michael Walker huge interception that turns into that Drake London touchdown. Alameda Zacchaeus scores a touchdown. I think I was writing frantically. I'm not even sure if I knew that that had happened. Uh, yeah, no. I think I said they scored another touchdown, and you're like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, when everything got really, really real and SoFi Stadium got really tense, yeah. is when Troy Anderson busts through the uh, Rams' defensive line. Mm-hmm. or I'm sorry. Uh, the, the Rams' kind of punt coverage line blocks the punt. Zoe Carter picks it up, runs it in for a touchdown, and then, and uh, then you're looking at it, and you're like, "This is a whole different can of worms now." Right. And they were in it. I think that was what was. I mean, for so long, it felt like the, uh, watching the game was just kind of. It felt like it was dragging, and it was like they. And it did feel like there were certain points in the first half where it was like, if the Falcons would just get out of their own way, they would be able to do some things. And and I think that was like re, that once you got to. The second half in that thir- that fourth quarter specifically, you saw the defense kind of come alive and you saw the offense get moving in a way that they hadn't been moving before. And so I it, it really did feel like the atmosphere kind of shifted, especially after that blocked punt. And here's the crazy thing. we There's still more crazy things to at least bring up. Now, we all know that you watched it, but I think something that – that gets forgotten in all of these wacky plays is that so after that the the blocked punt and the touchdown scored the Rams get the ball they ha- they they have a third down Stafford to Cooper Cup is automatic as it is Cooper Cup converts the mm-hmm. third down which seems like end of the road right until Darren Hall punches just- the ball out and then it kind of just rolls around for like a couple seconds and then he's the one that ends up grabbing it before he steps out of bounds that play in terms of just like not giving up. Like, I know Arthur Smith talks a lot about, like, if there's one thing this team is, like, we're going to play until the end. Like, until the last whistle blows, until the last minute, second has ticked off the clock. Like, we're going to be physical and we're going to fight until the end. And that play, I think, was indicative of that mindset. I think it completely personified this never say die attitude yep. that I talked to Michael Walker after the game and Jake Matthews and. Kyle Pitt said it. It's just this this willingness to continue to swing, even when they're down thirty one to ten in the fourth quarter. The continuing effort that is there. Okay. Effort is great. We're not giving out grades for effort here. Right. Not in a zero sum game like the NFL. You can discuss gray areas. That's what we do for a living. <laughs> but yes. when it comes down to it, did you win or, or did you lose? And the Falcons ultimately lost this game because after reco- Darren Darren Hall recovered his own fumble. <laughs> right. <laughs> the Falcons had three minutes, plenty of time to drive. Marcus Mariota throws an interception on third and thirteen, mm-hmm. I believe, mm-hmm. and it was one of those balls that. Uh, We're going to have to go back and watch the tape, but it just felt to me so Jalen Ramsey goes over the top and plucks it. It sort of seemed like you would mention that. Yeah, it felt like that maybe, like, yeah, that Brian Edwards maybe jumped too early or too late. Like, it just felt like the timing of his jump was also off, and it allowed Jalen Ramsey to kind of have an easier time getting to the ball. And that, that play was, I think, really frustrating because at, in that moment, the Falcons actually had time on their side. It was they. They honestly they didn't need to score too early, and because they didn't want to give the ball back to the Rams, and then but you don't want to like waste too much time, and you're looking at a third and long situation, which isn't great. But in that scenario, you know that you have two tries at it, and so you think, okay, you can pick up six and then try on fourth down, and then you know that's for all the marbles. But to throw an interception in that moment I think was really tough and that was, that was I think the moment that it really like sucked the the air out of the for lack of a better word like the falcon sails you know yeah and then they still had and then they still ch- had a chance and then they still had a chance yeah. because the rams can't convert they they score a safety on themselves free mm-hmm. kick it out of bounds setting up a 50 yard essentially one play hail mary yeah. that never got off the ground marcus mariota doesn't even get the the uh, pass off and ultimately the falcons lose this one and just a, a quick note about about the brian edwards play we're talking about this in an instant reaction format we yeah, don't we have the benefit of slowing it down on coaches film so yeah. we can evaluate that a lot more in the future we're just giving you initial impressions there right. so with all that kind of being said there were opportunities for the falcons to finish this game outright mm-hmm. we've seen arthur smith falcons teams 
do that before, but the head coach would be the first to say that each team is its own unique thing, and everyone's tired of hearing me say how, how performance in close games is not always translatable. Right, unless you have um, an Aaron Rodgers type elite quarterback, then it remains with that individual. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, when like when you look at it, how like how do you look at it? Because because you were saying you didn't even really feel like this was like a real serious comeback attempt until five minutes left in the, like in, in in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Do you view it as like opportunity lost? Do you view it as man they had to come back from so much? How do you view? this comeback attempt that we're talking about independent of everything that we're going to talk about next that happened earlier on. I think if I'm only looking at the fourth quarter alone, I'm very impressed by what I saw from this team, both offensively and defensively. Like when you look at the the first, like what, 10 to 13 minutes of the of the fourth quarter, you see a team that is very much fighting and very much in the game. If you ask me that in a, of the first half, I'm like, no, I don't feel like they're in the game because it didn't feel that way. There were a lot of moments where I, I wanted to see the Falcons play cleaner football, particularly in the red zone. But then you get them in the fourth quarter and it feels like a different group. It feels like a group that's re- rejuvenated and and having something to prove and wanting to go out and play well. And I, I, I wish that we could just talk about the fourth quarter without the context of the other three, same exact way that I felt like we, I I wanted to be able to talk about the first three quarters of the saints loss and not talk about the fourth. But when you're talking about these games, the fair way to do it is to talk about it in the full context of the game and all four quarters. And it's, I think, you know, Arthur Smith has said it before and it's like, one play, even though sometimes a lot of games come down to one play, that one play isn't the make or break deal of the game. You have to take into context all of the plays that led up to it. And and so for us, it was like, that was why after the game, I was like, yeah, the comeback's great and everything. And you love to see that fight, but it doesn't negate going 50% in the red zone and not scoring a touchdown until what, three minutes left to go in the third. Like that to me, if you are battling it out through four quarters, it's a different conversation than having to com- to put a lot of pressure on yourself to come back in the fourth. Yeah, and that's you are the queen of podcast podcast transitions because ah. it leads us directly in like into this next topic. Something I touched on ever so briefly in the instant replay. Go read that, <laughs> and 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 you delve into in great detail mm. um, in Tori's takeaways, and I think it's worthy of everybody going back to Tori's story and really taking a close. Oh, you're just saying that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I want the page view for you I and know. for me. Yeah. And plus, I wrote mine during the game when I'm frantically typing as fast as humanly possible. Yeah. You had a chance to ponder. I a did. More. I got to sit and, and just kind of sink it, let it all sink in. But I do go back to those the, those first two drives where mm-hmm. the Falcons got deep in like deep into the red zone. They had medium length distance to either score a touchdown or convert a first down. Penalties put them in long distances mm-hmm. and ultimately left them with two field goal attempts. One went through, one which of which did not. That's if you're a best case scenario, you get forced 14 points. Nearly worst case scenario which is what the Falcons had, you only get three. Yeah. And they and like and they hurt themselves and that was an issue. Young Way was very busy against the Saints. This is a continuing issue, a trend yeah. that that simply has to be rectified. Yeah, for the last two weeks the Falcons have gone they have a fifty percent touchdown conversion rate inside the red zone not good enough not good enough and Arthur Smith has said that like that's not going to win games in this league where everybody else is it's just not and you have to convert and as much and I've said this before and I'll say it again as much as I think this fan base loves and adores young way Koo, it'd be great to see less of him and yeah. it'd be great to not put so much pressure on him. It, I would love to see six or seven points, not three. And I think Jake Matthews said it best after the game. It's like the goal is to score touchdowns when you're in the red zone. Like that's that's the goal. The goal isn't to kick field goals, even though that's all well and good. You get points on the board, but the goal is to get it in the end zone. And I think it was really those drives where you're looking at the the Rams had a 14-3 to three lead in the, after those two drives and it was like 
14 to 3 is very different than 14 to 10, 14 to 7. Like, if they score a touchdown on one of those. And and then also going back to what you were saying in terms of the penalties inside the red zone. I mean, those hurt you as much as anything. And, and I think that was the frustrating part, and that was what I was looking at after the game. It's like – you can't go back. You can't say what if, what if, what if. But it's like if you put any points on the board on that first drive, to not come away with any points. Like th- we were talking last week, and Arthur Smith was talking about the red zone inefficiencies in the fourth quarter against the Saints and not being able to punch it in. He was like, you know, you you when you only settle for three, it mounts up, and that can hurt you later. We saw that actively happen in week two against the Rams. They don't score in the first half, and then you go – or don't score a touchdown in the first half, and then you go into the fourth quarter and you're playing super well. I mean, you those points, you miss them. You yeah. really do. I mean, you go back to this first drive, and I'm not going to get super – uh, micro on this, but 13 plays, eight minutes, six second drive, 54 yards, zero points. That's that's a hard pill to swallow. That the Rams turned into a touchdown. The next drive, they go for it. I think on fourth and two, turn it over on downs. Mm-hmm. The Rams turn that into a touchdown. Yeah. And now you're down 14 nothing, and you're not exactly sure what happened because you feel like you're playing pretty well, but somehow you're down two scores, and then then everything changes. Then right. game plans alter, and then you have to. Find heroic ways, but I do like again the way the Falcons stuck with it. But I think Tori, I think what I think we've, I think what I think that I think. <laughs> that's too many things. It's, it's like on Friends, like they don't know that we know that they know exactly. <laughs> but I, I believe I'm not ah, going to say the word go. think again. I I believe it's important that we showed what was good late, what was missing early, yeah. And when you have these things that are missing on a team. In transition, mm-hmm. with a lot of dead money not spent on talent, and a, and, a, and a team that has to fight and scrap for everything, they don't have the luxury of of margin for error that some yeah. of these better teams naturally do. So when you give away these opportunities, it hurts the Falcons in their current state mm-hmm. more than it would another team. Right. I hope that that makes sense to everybody, but I, I think ultimately that's an issue here. Yeah, I now, think also too, like when you think about it. <laughs> the Falcons were not only in these games, but could have won these games. Right. And if you are, I don't know who said it. It may again, it, again, it may have been Jake Matthews that was like, if we make one more play or if we do what we need to do correctly in the moments that matter, this is a completely different conversation that we're having. That means that the Falcons would be, ha- have two games won against two very, very good teams. And that's a completely different conversation. Obviously, that's not the conversation that we're having right now. But they're not. They're, I mean, they lost these games by, what, a total of five points? Right. That's that's crazy to me to think about it. Because I think a lot of people think that have thought that this team wouldn't be competitive in a lot of regards because of the transition that it's going through. But we are seeing them play competitive football. It's not pretty all the time. It's not perfect all the time. But they're in the last two games. Now, of course, no moral victories being in games when you don't pull them out. But, I mean, there is stuff that you can take from this. Yeah, and this is game two of a 17-game season, and this team has to find a way to take that next step, which yes. is finishing games. Mm-hmm. And I wrote one version of a headline of my column that Tori was like, uh, don't include the word finish. It's yeah. kind of a four letter word in like in this fan base. It doesn't make it any less important right. just because it triggers something in mm-hmm. the fan base. Yeah. And if we're looking at this you, team as its own individual entity and what Arthur Smith and Terry Fano are trying to do building it, they're trying to change some of these not narratives they don't like they don't care about narratives but they don't want to like that like they want to finish they want to be known as a team that can finish yeah they want to be kn- known as an explosive team um something that has come up at the end of this game was that kyle pitts the t- who turned in the second best season ever by a rookie tight end last year who mm-hmm. had a fantastic training camp mm-hmm. and i don't use that word lightly right uh f- Four catches for 38 yards on 10 targets through two games. He was targeted seven times in the first game. He was targeted three times. In this one, one of those targets drew a 36-yard pass interference call. Mm -hmm. Let's add that to his total. What the heck? Call it 70 yards. And it's still, when when you're losing games and your best 
player, regardless of position, I think that's fair to say, yeah. isn't producing steadily or isn't overwhelmingly targeted and you're losing, the, the, the questions naturally come up and they have come up about why Kyle isn't more actively involved mm -hmm. in the game. Um, it was a, I don't know, a flashpoint's too much of a term. But it was a topic of conversation mm -hmm. after this one. It's something that we're going to explore more. Yeah. And it's something that I think that we need to explore more. Um, yeah, because you know, I mean, Arthur I know, was asked about it after yeah. the game as well. Yeah. And I know I have a lot of questions too, because like, you, you know, we are talking about this within a couple hours of this game being over. We haven't seen an all 22 film. We don't know how the Rams defense was pressuring Kyle Pitts, how much they were shading coverage to him how that impacted what the Falcons could or couldn't do there are a lot of things I think that go into the targets that we didn't see Kyle Pitts have tonight mm -hmm. if if I'm being honest and you're right like Arthur Smith was asked about it and his his whole thing is he, he said he was like Kyle's a huge part of our offense and the thing is you have to take it with context it's the same thing we're trying to win and he has a huge impact on the game and he was going through it and he was talking about him being an important piece and how essentially he used the example of um, Cordero Hodge, who who had a really great play. I can't remember what quarter it was. All of it's First like, half. First half, yeah. And Arthur Smith says, you know, here's the example. You target him on a play, and if they cover him or they account for him, then Kadero Hodge comes in and makes a big play. It happened a few t a few times, things like that. It's not fantasy football. We're just trying to win, and we'll continue to look at everything and try to get better. And that was his quote, and like that's kind of where we are. I think there's a lot more analyzing to do, a lot more conversations to have about what is happening, whether it's at the quarterback position, tight end position, secondary they have a say in where a quarterback goes with the ball. I mean, all of these questions I think are valid to ask and, and also valid to try and figure out an answer. Yeah, because he's an impact player and the Falcons need him to be that impact player in ways beyond, look, he's doing better as a blocker. He's drawing coverage away, all those types mm -hmm. of things. The Falcons, again, in their current state, like they need their stars to really produce the, how court, uh, how Patterson ha mm -hmm. has done to this point. Um, and also like we were talking to Kyle in the locker room after the game. And I mean, he was getting grilled on <laughs> this uh, lack of targets and if he was upset about it and he kept saying like, like, what do you want me to do? You want me to go and scream at Arthur? Or do you want me to go and scream at Marcus for not getting the ball? He's like, I don't operate like that. He's like, I'm... And that's true. That's not his that's personality not, No, type. that's not his personality. And, like, he kept saying, I think he said it three or four times while we're sitting there talking to him, like, I'm not a selfish player. I want to win. I'm not a selfish player. I want to win. If And that's, like, the mantra that came from him after only being targeted a handful number of times today. Right. And... Can I transition to Drake Please. London and then and then moving on to our our final topic, which is Drake London. He's got again. I don't have the full stats in front of me. I apologize. It's late. Uh, but Drake London has had at least seventy yards receiving in both mm -hmm. games to this point. He had eighty six today. I believe seventy four last week. Yeah. That sounds very that sounds right. right. He he scored his and uh, he scored his. Uh, First league touchdown. First NFL touchdown. Yeah. He, he saved the ball. He said it's going in a case. It's nice. not going to his parents' house. It's going to his house. Aww. He's going to keep it with him. Um, that's a big moment. But this wasn't this wasn't um, a cause for universal celebration yeah. because they lost. And Drake London understands that, that you can have individual accolades, and he can be proud of some good moments that he had. But – they still lost the game. And he seemed to find the right balance of that when mm -hmm. he was talking. Uh, when I was there too. And when he was talking to me and some other uh, reporters as well, seemed to strike a good tone there. Um, but something that Arthur Smith said on Sunday night, and he said before, is it's confirming why they drafted him. Yeah. Because he's going out there. I, I even asked him. It's just feel like this NFL transit, this NFL thing is easier maybe mm -hmm. than you thought. He's like, no, it's not easy. It's just it shows that they're putting me in positions to win, and I think a lot of hard, detail-oriented work I've been doing on my own with the team sent from the spring and the summer is starting to pay off. That it's not, oh, I walked in and now I'm good now. Yeah. It's he's really worked on his craft on subtle things that help him get open and help him be what is 
ha- he has the complete package of traits to make mm-hmm. him a complete receiver. Yeah. Um, and what he's done to this point has been good. Of course, again, he wants them in winning effort. Right. And I, I think I go back to something that, you know, he was coming off of that knee injury. And I think I even said it on the last podcast. Like, I don't think anybody really realized how much that injury was impacting him in the preseason. Because when he was talking, it, it really did feel like it was a pretty significant injury that – it almost it didn't feel that way in the moment. And so to see him come out and do what he's done the last two weeks, I think is very commendable. But there was a moment, it was one of the first times that we saw him back out on the field after after the injury. And he was talking to TJ Yates, who is um, the Falcons wide receivers coach. And their conversation, it was very, it was like watching two people, like just trying to, figure each other out and like what works what doesn't work and I it and I'm standing kind of like off to the side you know I can't hear what they're saying but it they're literally talking about like arm movements and like how you would move like your wrist and your elbow like to get by a defender it was really fascinating to see them working on something as small and minute as that your arm placement and it's that type of stuff that and also just Drake London is a lot more, you know, we watch him in the pre-draft process and you see the highlights and everything. Drake London, I'll say this about Drake London, Drake London is way more of a fierce competitor than I originally thought he was because point. when we talk to him, he's very calm, very quiet, cool, collected, just chill. On the field, he is, he like gets mad. Like he, he wants, like there was a moment where, um, Marcus threw a quote-unquote interception, but it was called uh, pass interference. It was intended for Alameda Zacchaeus, and it lands in, I can't remember whose hands. And Drake comes up and like kind of like punches the ball. Right. And he comes over to the side, and he has his helmet on. He kind of slaps it, and it's like, this guy is a very fierce competitor. This is a guy who really, really wants to win. Not saying that everybody doesn't want to win. Everybody does want to win. But to see kind of how Drake London operates in these game scenarios and how – fierce and heated he gets it's very fun he's a very very fun player to watch I mean even hurdling a guy down the sideline I mean he's making these plays that it's like okay this all makes sense he's the guy that they they wanted to go after in the draft yeah and I think ultimately look Kyle Pitts is gonna get his yeah he just will he's he's too good to not yeah 100 percent. so he's gonna get his Drake London is is gonna get his the Falcons are gonna win some games they're going to lose some more too, but they're going to win. And this team, these individuals are going to continue to evolve and grow. And what I think fans should really try to keep an eye on big picture wise is how are they progressing week to week? How are they continuing to get better? And Arthur Smith said it, it's time for a breakthrough and a breakthrough yeah. is a win. Jake Matthews said, I don't care if it's three to nothing or 55 to 54 <laughs> that is our next step no more we're doing some good things dot 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 but mm-hmm. the next thing is we are doing some good things that resulted in a victory yeah and that's what we're going to be looking on throughout the course of this week we're going to be and uh, a complete game and I, I a complete very much game. want to see a complete game and uh, we're going to be keeping an eye out for all of those types of things. We're going to be in the great state of Washington for the entire week. Tori McElhaney and I look forward to it. lots of exclusive content. They're going to be uh, practicing up here. And we're going to have full coverage on AtlantaFalcons.com. Do your thing, y'all. Rate, <laughs> r- rate r- review, subscribe, all that it fun so stuff. <laughs> it is so late that Scott has thrown out of y'all. <laughs> yeah, and now – Falcons Final Whistle is part of one individual channel. If you subscribe to Falcons Final Whistle, awesome. Thank you. Uh, We have something called the Atlanta Falcons Podcast Network, which is Falcons Audible, our new podcast, Falcons in Focus, and Falcons Final Whistle, all on one channel. Subscribe to one. Get all the good stuff. Go over to YouTube. Do your thing. There's a bunch of different ways you can consume this content. Appreciate you sticking around probably on a Monday morning at this point listening yeah. to this and know that it's 1045. I haven't edited this thing yet. So <laughs> I'm staying up late for you people. <laughs> anyway, Bless it. we're all getting ready to go to bed. Uh, thank you so much, Tori. And oh. thank you guys for downloading and listening. Talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>